Und ich freue mich jetzt sehr, mit Ohan Pamuk, dem Literaturnobelpreisträger, über seine Fotografieausstellung im Günther Grass Haus in Lübeck zu sprechen. Ohan Pamuk, your ambition to photograph comes from an unhappiness as a writer you have stated. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, but maybe I misrepresented myself. There's a problem of communication. First, I am a very happy writer. <laughs> I wrote all the books that I wanted to write, that I also, I enjoyed playing around with the form, inventiveness, even a bit of experimental writing while the books were popular. I'm a happy writer also in the sense that not only I wrote the books that I wanted to write, but I also got recognition, acceptance. My books are translated to 62 languages. And if I say I am an unhappy writer, it's a mistake. I am, relatively speaking, I know my writer friends. Relatively speaking, I'm a happy writer. But even the happiest of all writers have problems of expressing himself, form, writing, it's not good enough, you get it. So, as I wrote in the introduction, as I was writing a strangeness in my mind, I had some trouble. So, and I had this um, new camera with me, and whenever I was in trouble, I was sitting here and the camera was like, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, a nice boat is passing, you know? Why don't I take a photo? It's like that. So, we don't, so it was not theoretical. Um, I was happy. I was not happy with daily writing. I was happy with taking photos with my new Canon 5 camera, which I bought from that shop uh, from in New York. You are so you're curious, why did I buy my photo from the uh, camera and equipment from New York? Perhaps, maybe I didn't tell you. I am a professor at Columbia University, one semester each year. So that shop, which you call the biggest, best, Okay. Um, photography equipment shop in the world that is only half an hour away from my home by subway. So that's why I go there. Uh, do you remember how old were you when you received your first camera? Yeah, I remember. Because uh, uh, they gave my brother when he a photo camera and he was 10. And when I reached 10, they also gave me one. Ah. But... <laughs> We were very competitive. At that time it was very expensive to take photos. One had to be very careful uh, to set the correct lighting and so. What did you, int uh, what did the child or Han Pamuk interest to photograph? What you would say, family photos, photos to remember. But I was also, I had also some of my subjects. Yes, this thing that you just mentioned, the fact that in 50s, 60s, 70s, or put it more um, clearly, before the invention of digital film, or before the cameras, but digital, it was very expensive. My point about this cultural phenomenon, now that it is free, uh, people still behave as if uh, them, they are shooting photos on silver film, as if that film is expensive. I am amazed or curious why don't people take as many as photos they want because it's all free. All you have to get is a phone, mobile phone and you can take. But people don't take. It's very interesting. They go to a party, this or that. I always come with a camera, you know, a cheap camera, not an artistic camera. And I also believe photography is something like that. Not you have a fancy camera and take fancy artistic photo. I take, take, take photos. It's part of my life. And then they all say, these my friends or the people I meet, oh, can we have those photos? Can we have, would you please send these photos to me? Well, you know, why don't you bring along your camera? And if you want a photo with me, okay. <laughs> But people are, I don't know, lazy, are not interested, are only get interested if other people are interested. They don't, I don't know. But I think one of the wonderful things technologically that happened in the last 15 years is that taking photos are now cheaper, that they are not worrying about, wow, where do I get this film? It's expensive. Would you buy two of them and then give me a discount so that I have another 24 photos? And, you know, think about 
um, very stingily as I, in my childhood, I was worried about um, in losing one shot. You have to think. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's very interesting. Um, but um, 10 years before me, in the 50s, no one had cameras. Uh, only the high, highest bourgeoisie had the cameras. And then when someone had a camera and a film behind it, expensive with silver, then everyone in the office, everyone in the family would, oh, can I also come in the picture because no one was taking your photos? Uh, I had in the Museum of Innocence exhibited those photos taken in the 50s. In all the family, or what they call as photo for the occasion, uh, family photos or photos to remember. Uh, if there is a film, there's always 50 heads pushing their heads to, uh, to hit the silver. <laughs> because it was expensive. No one is taking photos. In fact, you also see some photos in the book with the same psychology that someone taking photos is a rare thing. You have to be around. You have to hit the camera. So when I go to back streets, in poor neighborhoods, children immediately recognize the photographer. And with the culture of 1950s, 60s, photographer, photographer, me, me. <laughs> we, want, <But. laughs> we want to be seen. We want to get our piece of attention. What made you go and wander through the streets of Istanbul with your camera? Yeah, Urban wanderlust? First, in, uh, this is my second photo book. Mm -hmm. My first it was modest. I was not even venturing out into the streets. I was taking photos from my balcony. But here, um, so it's so complicated. But more or less, I like to walk in the streets of Istanbul day or night. And I like to walk with a purpose. Uh, in fact, I sometimes jokingly tell my friends, forget about photography, I write a strangers in my mind, a story which takes place in the poor neighborhoods, um, shanty towns, um, in, uh, the peripheries of Istanbul. And in order to write that novel with my girlfriend, we went all to these peripheries. We used to look at the map, let's go there. And then we would go take photos, um, take notes, study. You know, Henry James wrote Princess Casabissima, which is about poor neighborhoods, just walking in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. He was not one of these people that, that's in the book. Uh, so, more or less, I like doing it. I am a, um, I am a walker in the street, but I am a, not this cultured uh, person who looks to the window. What was the name that artistically they gave it to this? Uh, flanner. I am not a flanner. Um, I am something else. I go to back streets. I like to see the people in their houses. And I like night photography because at night you see the insides, the orange light inside the house and people having their dinner, people looking at TV. I mentioned this in Blackpool and my other books, some modest person walking at night in the streets and looking at windows, seeing the lives of other people tenderly with attention not rad with radical criticism, but just to see the life of a family um, through a window. I like that. And that window should perhaps be orange color, or like that window should perhaps be a window like in my childhood. You describe in your book Orange the change in the public lighting in Istanbul from the old orange light to the cold new white light. What did this change imply to you, to the writer Orhan Pamuk and the photographer Orhan Pamuk? Yes, um, of course, all of us, we notice things just like aging. When we get older, we don't notice when we get old. Or when something happens, a sickness starts, we don't remember when it first started. Uh, but one day, I definitely noticed self-consciously that the lamps, street lamps, or lamps in house, the light bulbs of Istanbul are changing color. Thus, so the um, street landscape, the uh, street landscape of the city, my city, is changing dramatically. Orange light or light, yellow light bulbs delivered an orange light, which I like, which I associate with 
coldness, homeliness, not necessarily happiness or um, economical happiness, mm -hmm. but some an idea of belonging, um, that it is warm here, friendship, nice things. While I associate white light uh, with industry, um, uh, refrigerator, cold, I don't like white lights. And I mean, whoever I talk, uh, talk about this, my friends in Turkey, they all say, yes, I also don't like. And then I notice that he's losing a white light on his desk. What about that? They don't even notice. <laughs> but I'm not very critical of them. I was also like that. I, but in the end, I have a, I am, a, I have a painterly eye. I am. I care about seeing. I care about colors. I care about vari variations of light and shadow. Part of my writerly habit is because of that. So you documented this change, but uh, through your uh, uh, walking through Istanbul, you didn't go there alone. You had a bodyguard with you. Why? Yes, yes. Of course, maybe I have to be modest here. You said you documented that change. Yes, but it is, Dennis is also slightly an excuse, an invented um, reason to go out in the streets. But yes, I want. I have that kind of imagination. Self-imposed encyclopedic assignment is my style. So I immediately began, oh, okay, let me go to and write down 15 neighborhoods. I walk in the streets, then I look at my hand, then I get in touch with my bodyguard. Yes, you are asking about that. Because I say, okay, on Wednesday night we're going out. Because there is, um, and what do I mean by that? Okay, um, I think some 14 years or 15, 12 years ago, Turkish government gave me bodyguards after I received Nobel Prize and also after my Armenian friend Kuran Dink was dinged, was killed in the street, not only to me, to other Turkish writers who were getting death threats, were also on, I would say, political, had found themselves in political attacks, you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, being a writer in my part of the world, you we'll always get some attacks and you try to survive. Uh, but and, and at, that, at the beginning, I had three bodyguards and they were so big, you would notice them. It was embarrassing. But after a while, the government reduced them to three. I sometimes joke, and probably the government decided that uh, there is more free speech in Turkey and we are improving. <laughs> I used to joke about that. And my number is reduced to uh, from three to one. <laughs> and in the end, now I have a bodyguard, now maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, who is my bodyguard for almost, you know, for about eight, ten years, who is my friend. So I called my friend, which is a, who is a bodyguard, and I said, uh, and now I forgot to tell this very crucial information, I'm nervous. Um, once you have a bodyguard, someone from the government, police, who his job is to protect you and the government wants to protect, half of the government wants to protect you, half of the government wants to sue you. This was how about the situation some eight years ago. But uh, uh, then you can go any place. So what do I mean you can go any place? You know, in all towns there are neighborhoods, places you don't want to go, and they say that it's dangerous, don't go there. Mm -hmm. I, after the bodyguard, I didn't have any place like that. And that was a delight. Or, it's not night, it's not a dangerous neighborhood, but it's a courtyard, private courtyard, or it's some place you don't know. Okay, I, I'm a photographer. I, I go, cha, 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 cha. Someone comes there. I have my bodyguard, I'm not worried. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't we disappear. So, yes, there is a desire to photograph everything, and the bodyguard, because he's a government person, and also, there's an issue of privacy. Maybe I'll talk about that. Um, I mean, people, especially in this orange book, you see that most of the photos were taken at night after uh, after eight and nine, nine o'clock, because they were taken mostly in spring and early summer, where the sun went down late. So you would see all these people in the photos where I shot them, all these photos, all, not all of them, there are also winter photos as you can see. Uh, but people would have their dinner, then, especially in poor neighborhoods, 
it's a tender summer, uh, a spring or summer night. And all these people had spent the winter inside their homes, in their small homes, which were hard to heat. Now spring is coming. They're not in countryside. They're right in the hardest place in the city. But they behave, they go out. Mm -hmm. They relax in the streets. They bring out their chairs. The street is the part of their private home. So if I venture into that place, chop, 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 taking first, I am privileged as a fuck of my God, I can change, take, as you pointed out, the intimacy, the privacy of these people are right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. and, and more than an overabundance of them. On the other hand, well, you're scared, you know, these people may get angry, you are introducing in their privacy. Though I have a bodyguard, I'm relaxed. But forget about the bodyguard. There is also an inhuman side to that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the family is enjoying their after dinner conversation. Sometimes they also bring along TV outside. You would see them, okay? And they make it just like a living room and chat. Children are playing. There are also mothers are watching children playing with other children. And all of this chat, 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 chat. That was such a fun reading. <laughs> and I'm happy I did this. And, and how did and the people react to you? Yes, and I wrote about that many, many times. There are so many funny stories too. I sometimes tell my friends, for example, I was at the top of the, you know, a hill, uh, a shanty hill that I always said in my, uh, in, in the last, I'll go there one day, take photos. Finally, we went there, with, but, but it got two years ago. For this book, actually, I had a contract for um, Gerhard Stedel. Mm -hmm. And so we went there and we were at the top of Norway place. But it, uh, that, Photos at the end of the book showing a general panoramic view. Mm -hmm. It was from that bench. Then we're taking these photos from the hill. And then we're in the some, I would say, 20 year, three or four buddies are talking. Who is this guy? Why is he taking? I'm going to talk to him. You know, the other one is saying, why is, he, why is he taking our photos? I'm going to talk to him. While my buddy guy is behind, is hiding a bit. That the one is like, don't go, why? He can take, he cannot take. This is our neighborhood. Why is he taking? Well, I'm going. Then suddenly he goes. Then the bodyguard and I, since we had so much experience of this kind of intrude uh, people, stop, don't take, this is my life. Why did you take my for vice photo, this kind of thing? Then the bodyguard goes out from the shadow <laughs> in the vice. <laughs> we always laugh at these things. <laughs> and again, you understand? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's embarrassment that you're protected by the government taking these photos mm -hmm. but on the other hand it's i'm not in i really feel that i'm not betraying anyone's privacy it's a general photo of the city and it's i also took, took these photos tenderly respecting these people's lives and their privacy and i was always felt clumsy when they, these people felt threatened that i'm an outsider may use, abuse their privacy. Uh, so I was also, they always wanted to be modest. My mood of taking these photographs, and I go out one night for this book, it's three or four hours, and the camera is heavy, you get tired, you walk, you don't want to pick up problems, you take chuck, 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 mm, you are chuck, chuck, chuck. Mm. I don't know what other photographers do. This is what I like. Uh, and also taking so many photographs gives you a sense of accomplishment. You did something. Something that I discovered uh, and wrote about in the introduction to, uh, of the previous book. That I was not good in writing that day. But if you take a nice photo of the boats that are passing, it's an accomplishment. You At least you preserved something. What has the writer Orhan Pamuk learned from the photographer Orhan Pamuk? Good question. I was impressed by this question. I learned, um, uh, okay, but first I answer, what did the photographer learn from the writer? Uh, um, and you also ask that. And the photographer learned to be patient from the writer. When I was taking photos, before I was a writer, before I had, you know, I'm writing novels for the last 47 years, but before I had, and after 45 years, you have an ethic. You, you have an almost craftsman ethic, devotion to what you're doing. You don't count it. You don't, uh, um, uh, so 
But that is also patience. You write a sentence, you don't say, wow, this is Shakespeare. No. Being a writer, after 45 years, you learn. You have to have a steady walk. You know what you're doing. You're not stuck with little things, little this or that. You know what you're doing? There's a meaning and there's a modesty and you have to go. You have a plan, you go. This I learned and tried to apply to photography. Always thinking, come on, Orhan, don't look for big results. Just don't look for glamour. Just continue doing this all the time. Also, I have an encyclopedic mind to preserve things. This neighborhood, that neighborhood, I was counting things to, give, uh, to, um, to motivate myself. Uh, but in the end, in the, uh, the fact that I've been writing novels for 45 years also taught me to be quiet, modest, understanding. Don't expect boom, boom, boom. In your youth, you expect you write something, a poem, everyone is admiring. Especially in photography, don't expect. You know, and this is my, uh, the writer in me taught to the photographer, if there's a photographer in me, by the way. But, uh, but what did the writer learn from the photographer? And I would say, wow, so much, the subject matter. Here, I would say the subject matter. Mm -hmm. All these neighborhoods. You know, I was writing, I started, in a way, this book. There are some photos here taken by other Leica or other cameras 20 years ago. But most of them were taken in the last five, six years. As I was writing, a strangers in my mind. The hero, some of my readers here did, uh, realized that, oh, these photos are taken when you were writing a stranger in my mind. Yes, back streets, even some streets very close to central Istanbul, but run down, very poor streets. Um, and I go there and I also photograph, uh, photograph the street sellers' carts just to imply, you know, and my character was, uh, Mevlut was living here or that kind of thing. And so I was learning about these streets. And also, then if you love these streets, if you go to these places a lot, somehow I think you begin to like them, love them. I always argue that when I started, my name is Red. I didn't know much about miniature painting, but I gave it them so much time just looking at the beginning, just like everyone, that I don't understand anything. What is this? Why do they give it that? What is the beauty? But after a while, um, um, when you give time to art, you also, when next time you look at it, you also honor the time you gave it to like it. Mm -hmm. And after a while, uh, your devotion or determination to love this work of art or whatever also counts. Uh, and you like it because you gave so much time to like it. And you li I like these neighborhoods. Because I like these photos, because I thought about them, and I decided to like them in a way. That that is I mean, yes. <laughs> the photos in orange uh, tell much about the Yanis headedness of Istanbul, the different character from the city by day and by night. What are these differences? How, in what ways is Istanbul by night different from the daylight Istanbul? Okay, um, I like. Um, okay. Um, in, in at night, uh, okay, during the day, I am busy with my things, perhaps busy with my business, which is writing your novel, which is already hard and dramatic. If I go out in the streets, these are shops, people, it's a men's, mostly men's world, men's business world, people are buying, selling, buying, selling, some, some, a lot of lights. Um, while at night, you see family. You see, these people are not killing each other to make money. They are tenderly relaxing. Children playing football in the day, children are in the school. Children playing football, shouting at you. Everyone is happier, I think, at night. Because everyone is happier or in their element with their families. There are lots of family photos in, in this book, which I like. And, and I like this uh, almost orange light of the family coming out in the streets. By contrast, your book Balcony, with the photographs from the balcony, you have taken over 8,500 pictures from your balcony, they document very isolated, very lonely pictures. Exactly. I think um, um, that book, uh, Balcon, uh, Balcon, and this book Orange are entirely two different books. 
that is not human, human, uh, human beings and families. Balkan is essentially a landscape uh, book, landscape photography, and landscape, um, landscape painting and landscape photography has a problem with representing human beings, but we decide to have a landscape. And that's a landscape book. Yes, you can criticize any landscape painter or photographer, where are the human beings? And not only when they are not around, it's hard to get that tenderness, that um, intimacy, that, um, and I like that. Uh, well, is one thing. I want to take also more landscape photos, but this book is more about intimacy of lower class life in back streets of Istanbul. Orange is an excuse. Orange, yes, light bulbs are changing. But this change is an excuse. But once you have the photos, you're shocked to see it. There is a real change, actually, and no one is noticing. Then you understand. Yeah, maybe I like colors. I pay attention to colors. Everyone is saying, oh, so many colors in your books, your book titles. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe because of that, too. <laughs> Now, we are talking at the Günther Grass House in Lübeck. Uh, you have met Günther Grass in Istanbul, for example. Uh, what did Günther Grass mean to you? First, um, I read first, I knew about Günter Grass because Tindron was translated to Turkish and it was an event. I read Tindron, but what Günter Grass for me means is that he invented something or made something new in Tindron. What is that? Everyone was writing about that period, Nazi period, Second World War, whatever. Uh, in, uh, was trying to tackle with that period through realism. Everything should be realistic. While he invented this fantastic character, which paid way to such different, which made such a difference, really. And with uh, Tindram, he influenced Garcia Marquez. He was influenced, I would say, Rafle. He influenced Gab uh, Garcia Marquez and Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. uh, and he invented something. Then I also, um, then he came to Turkey. He was more Yashar Kemal's friend. He would mm -hmm. stay with him, see him. I was younger and we would be looking from distance. <laughs> and then I'll be, uh, when was the year? I think this was 2011 or 12, when there was a uh, volcano in Ireland and there were mushroom clouds over Europe. And he visited Istanbul for a day, but because of mushroom clouds, Günther Grass couldn't go back to Germany. So for three nights we went and, and drank and talked. <laughs> he was also a generous guy, direct, a, a direct person mm -hmm. that you can address anything and talk. He was, for me, he didn't seem pretentious. But in a way, how many times did I see him? Anyway, to sum it up, I like him. I, um, I respect him. Now, Günter Grass was the big champion for democracy in Germany, the defender of the Enlightenment principles, the public intellectual. Is he in But any... It's sort of an irony in your question. <laughs> was he in uh, any way a role model for you? Was he in any way a role model for you? No. Um, uh, if you ask a role model for me like that, it's Jean-Paul Sartre. Because okay. Günter Grass was younger to be a role model for me. Mm -hmm. uh, when his books were around, I was already formed, formed mentally uh, with the example of Jean-Paul Sartre, who influenced my father. He had, my father had all the Gallimard books, all the books about Jean-Paul Sartre, he used to talk about that. And for me, for me, the brave person who criticized the government who took risks, well, Günther Grass was perhaps like this, was Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, and he was, of course, following the um, um, Zola tradition in a contemporary way. Uh, Günther Grass, I also cared about him because he, was, he wanted to be an artist. He was a dross man. And he also, when we were together, proudly said, you know, I have a publisher, Stadel. Then suddenly, Stadel is my publisher. I'm also happy about that. Maybe he was a model for me 
for having uh, for having Gerhard Stedel as a friend. <laughs> so we have come full circle in that respect, at least. Yeah. Yes. Ohan Pamuk, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Uh, I also enjoyed talking to you, Dennis, so much. Thank you. Thank you. And one last question I have, of course. I'm told by your German publisher, Hanse, that your latest novel that you have been working on has something to do with a pandemic. Is that true? Yes. I, thought, I wrote it and uh, it, I wrote a one page article in Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, I am writing for the last five years a novel called Nights of Plague about the third plague pandemic, which takes place between 1897 and 1901. It was a damning pandemic. It killed uh, tens of millions of people in India and China, and almost no one died in Europe. What a, it was the same micro. What a mysterious thing, and no one wrote a novel about this. And I'm, I am finishing my novel in one month. I am so excited. And I also want to tell you, if we have time, uh, I wrote that novel only looking and reading documents. Then the real thing happened. It was so scary. Uh, and everyone afterwards asked me, what did you, reading the documents, didn't realize? Uh, and what's in the book? Um, and yes, I never talk about fear as I was writing my book. Uh, because I was writing my book, reading books. But then the fear came. I was afraid and I gave my fear to my characters and it was okay for my book. Well, I can't wait to read that novel. I'm looking forward to it. Ohan, take care, stay safe. Thank you so much. Very much. Bye-bye.